Hi teachers, thank you for visiting my channel today. I know you have lots of work to do at school and you are stressed with so many things going on. But I want you to remember that everything you do, they have long lasting influence on your students. They may not tell you because they're probably shy, but they truly appreciate your presence in their lives. Just a quick background for today's video. I have been teaching for 22 years. 17 years of that was in the Philippines and five years in Orlando, Florida. If you are watching this video, you are most likely struggling with classroom and behavior management at your school. And now you are asking yourself if you are in the right profession or not. For those in the US, you might be regretting going there and are telling yourself you should have just stayed. I feel you. I have been there. Whether you are a teacher who is in the US or wherever else, classrooms and students are similar in some way so i hope you will find benefits to watching this video my first year in the u.s was a year of observing learning and lots of crying occasionally it involves me thinking of quitting and just going back home i was not happy and for the first time honestly i felt like teaching was not for me as a teacher who experienced teaching in a foreign country especially where the culture is different compared to ours where behavior problems are more challenging, I know what kind of information you need. When I was new, I did not know what to ask, so I did not know how others could help me, even if they are willing to help and that they can help. In today's video, I want to share with you some things and practices that I did in my classes that have helped me manage my class and my students' behaviors. Doing these things helped me not just to survive my day-to-day, -day, but also allowed me to start liking my job there and eventually it led me to hoping I could stay forever but here I am back in the Philippines so what does that tell you I am telling you that five years is short so you have to do something to enjoy the rest of that five years otherwise all of your memories will revolve around the crying and the regretting parts you might even develop some sickness of sort just because you have been stressed for so long and quite often you have to do something because if your class is chaotic, you will not be able to do what you went there for, and that is to teach. Not all schools will be willing to train you for more than a year. Of course, they also have other tasks at hand. So it would be appreciated if you are able to adjust and to learn the tricks of the trade, so to speak, as soon as you can. The earlier you are able to do this, the better for you too. If this is something you find interesting and helpful, please like the video, leave a comment, and share. Please subscribe if you have not done so already. I want to tackle this topic in terms of teacher traits and practices that will help with classroom and behavior management. I know there are many classroom and behavior management videos on YouTube, but I am taking it on a different route. In this case, I'll be discussing to you what teacher traits will be effective in order to overcome these challenges. These are all based on my personal experience, so I know that they they work and that I have tested them. Opposite the teacher trait, I will give examples of what I did in my classes that demonstrate the trait in action. So let's go to the list. Number one is consistency. Now how do you show consistency in your class. You can do that by establishing routines, procedures, and expectations and sticking to them. What do students do as soon as they get in the class? During class and when it is time to leave. In my classes, the first thing they do as they get in the classroom is to do the bell work. They know where to find it, how long it is, and it's always seven minutes long, how many chances they have, they have three chances, how many deductions they get for turning in late work, that's 2% each day after the day it's due. This is set automatically in Canvas, so I don't ever need to fuzz with it manually, so because you might think it's too burdensome to deduct two points each day. This one is set in the software, so it's doing it automatically. If your school does not have this tool, then I suggest to do the deductions in a doable way. Simplify it. Instead of taking out 2% per day and it's late, maybe you can just settle down with taking away some points regardless of how late the work is. Make it simple. When it is easy to do on your part, it will be easy for you to keep at it and be consistent. Do not implement procedures that have so many components and that require lots of tiny details and messing around 
down on your part because it will become overwhelming and it will end up being an additional chore. During class, their phones should be in their backpack, their backpack should be on the floor, laptop should be turned on, no horse playing, no going to the bathroom during the first and the last 10 minutes of class, etc. Do you have a designated day for quizzes or labs or notebook checks? In my case, Friday is a quiz or a test day. It's automatic. This goes without saying that I never give surprise quizzes. In my life as a teacher and as a person in general, surprise quizzes do not do anything for me. It is unfair. Even adults want to be prepared for a test or quiz because the day is designated and I stick to it. They don't ask me anymore. They don't get surprised for coming to the classroom on a Friday with the chairs arranged for testing. They know where to find it and how long the quiz or the test is. They also know that the coverage of that week's quiz is all about the things we covered from Monday through Thursday. And as for the test, I usually decide based on how far along we are in the chapter and I tell them in advance and also post the reminder somewhere in the classroom or in Canvas. They also know how many chances they get, how many decimal places for the final answers if the questions are problem solving type, etc. They also turn in notebook every other Friday of the month. No asking anymore. They know to put their notebook on the trays designated for their period. They know in advance what I will look for and how many points that notebook check is. This one varies because it depends on how many notes I have asked them to write down. They know that they should put the date on the upper right corner of the page of their notebook. Even for what notes to take down, they know. I put on my slide, copy this. If I want them to copy that part of the slide in their notebook. Also, if it's a board work, like sample worded problems that we solved in class, they know that they should copy that. They also know that I will look for any charts I gave them, such as formula sheets, graphs, tables, worksheets. They also know that they can still turn in their notebook in case they fail to turn it in that Friday. These routines that I established help my students to rely on me and my system. It is clear to them what to expect every day, every Friday, every Every other Friday. Having this helps my students to have stability. It helps them to not worry about certain things in class since they know they have three chances. Since they know that they can still turn in work, they know where to find things, they know how to reach for me if they have questions. In this way too, the students develop self-reliance and therefore they do not bother me with this trivial information. You will be surprised that there will even come a time when they would just correct and remind each other they will answer their classmates questions for you every time I see this happen I give myself a pat in the back I feel so proud of myself and my students you know as teachers it is stressful to be bombarded by students asking the same things all the time if this is a common thing that happens in your class maybe it is because you did not establish routines procedures and expectations or if you have, you probably are not consistent with enforcing them. You probably keep changing rules and procedures within the year so that they don't know anything for sure anymore. So of course, they will always ask you. If they feel like they always have to ask you, it means they have not developed that self-confidence and stability because your system is not reliable. Always remember that as teachers, we do not just teach subject matters like physics or math. But students must also learn soft skills that they will be able to use in life, even after they leave school. Another way to show consistency as a teacher is by enforcing rewards and consequences quickly and without fail. I think one of the reasons that new teachers second guess and doubt themselves when it comes to enforcing rewards and especially consequences is because they do not know yet or they're not sure if they're allowed to do or say some things. That is why this one gets easier the longer you stay in that school because each year you will realize, oh, I can say this 
to kids or do this and they are okay with it because the school allows it or because it is not a violation of anything. When you are not confident with enforcing rewards and consequences, the students could tell. So the best way to address this second guessing and doubt would be to really know the school culture by observing, knowing the school's rules and regulations by reading the teacher manual and student handbook and by asking questions to the right people. A lot of us teachers do not realize that in this case, truly, knowledge is power. When you know the rules of the game, you can definitely score some points. So if you establish certain rules, there would definitely be consequences if the students do not follow these rules and there are rewards if they do. If you already know what you can say or do because you have done your assignments like I have described earlier, then you will not have problems with being firm with the rules. You can confidently enforce them in class and you can stand by it when a student challenges it just because he has to face a consequence. This way also your admin can support you. When a violation arises, make sure to quickly apply the consequences exactly as you have communicated them to the students and do it without fail. Do not change or bend the rules. This way, the students know that you mean business, that you are not playing. Applying consequences quickly helps with letting the students know why what they did was wrong right away. Do not punish them a week or a month after an infraction was done. Do not apply consequences without them knowing that you have applied it. They may not remember or know what that punishment or consequence was for. They will not learn the lesson this way and therefore the same violation will be done over and over again. For instance, if your rule says that you will not accept late assignments, then never accept late assignments. No drama, no explanations, no sarcasm. Just apply the consequences like you're drinking water because you're thirsty. Natural as that. You know what I'm saying, right? Okay, so you might say, oh no, that's too harsh. What if the students have valid reasons for turning in assignments late? Well, that is why you have to make sure that your rules, rewards, and consequences are well thought of, well communicated, and with clear procedures. So what do I mean by this? In my class, any assignments that we have will be due a week from when we did them. After a week, then the assignments are considered late. That's when the consequence of deductions apply. This gives the students one whole week to do the assignments and turn them in without deductions. If your rule says that you will not accept late assignment, then it's not harsh because you actually gave them one week to work on it. Now you might say one week is not too kind or too lax. Come on, let's be honest. In reality, we even accept assignments as one year late. Okay, that's an example exaggeration but I know you get what I mean. We usually end up accepting late assignments no matter how late because our school admin would like us to give the students a chance or to help the students pass the quarter otherwise they will not graduate or will not be promoted to the next level. I mean, is that not the reality? So I realized that by giving my students one week before it is considered late, that's long enough to let them know that I am being considerate and that they cannot complain that they were not given enough time. At the same time, because the time is definite, I'm not changing it at all. When something is considered late, the students will know when the consequence will apply and why they apply. Also, during deliberation time, I can confidently say to my admin, that the students are given enough time to complete the assignments, seek help that they need, and so that the zero that they have on that assignment was their choice and decision. Just like anywhere, the students will test you and see if you mean what you say. If they know that they can do as they want without consequences, then the students will end up running the class instead of you running it. I will be doing a vlog about specific behavior problems and how to deal with them, so watch out for that. For instance, how do you deal with students using their phones in class when they're not supposed to? Or how do you deal with students who are being disruptive in class? So make sure to 
hit the notification bell so that you will know if I have new videos on my channel. Okay, so the next teacher trait that's going to determine whether your class will be managed or not is your organization. Are you organized? When I was a student, I hated teachers who were not organized. I am personally an organized person, so maybe that is why, but even if you are not organized yourself, it is always preferred to have a teacher who is organized. This helps the students with knowing where to find things things, where to put things, how things must be done, when things should be done and completed, etc. This will reduce chaos in the classroom and therefore will help with saving time and energy of everybody including the students. Here are ways on how we can practice being organized based on my experience. Number one, even if you don't believe on this one or you feel like it's just an extra work, make sure to create seating plan and enforce it. This is especially necessary necessary during the first quarter when you are just establishing order in class and also getting to know your students. How you assign seats may depend on some things, but most definitely not on the basis of intelligence. You will not have enough knowledge on this yet at this point. But for now, you can assign seats based on a certain order. Just do not let the students choose where they want to sit at this point. Alphabetical order is quite common and is the easiest to do for the time being and that's also the fastest way to know your students. You can be more purposeful with your sitting plan later on once you already know your students profile and needs. But obviously if there are students who need to sit at a certain spot due to accommodations then make sure to consider that on the get-go. I make sure to always refer to my sitting plan to help me remember students name faster. I use it when I want someone to recite or to do a school task. If you want to add photos on it, it's up to you. Always ask the student's permission when you will be using their photos anywhere in your class. The second way to be organized is to decorate your classroom in a purposeful way. It should not just be all about cuteness and purely anchor charts. Make sure that your decorations include classroom procedures, routines, and expectations where the students can easily and clearly see them. If the students could see this, it would be easier for you to remind them if they seem to be forgetting by calling their attention to it. For instance, if the students are using their phones during class, you can say, hey John, could you please read rule number three for me? Make sure that you phrase your rules in a way that's simple to understand and it should not be too long. Otherwise, it would look like you have enlarged an entire book and posted it on the wall, kind of. Also, make sure to consider functionality when choosing decorations and deciding where to put things in the classroom. You want each thing you put in your classroom to serve the purpose of helping students to be organized, well-informed, and self-reliant. For instance, make sure to designate a place in your classroom where students can access information about important days like holidays or when major assignments are due, exam dates, your period by period schedule, etc. Also make sure you have a place for posting special announcements or list of requirements, information about scholarships or school events, etc. This way, again, they do not have to bother you with this information. They could find it themselves and they know where to look for such information. I have a video about decorating classroom that empowers students on my YouTube channel, so definitely check that out if you are interested to know more about how I decorate my classroom and some tools that I used that helped me and my students to be organized in class. Next thing that you can do to be organized is to create a system for how the students will turn in assignments, where they will put things, what to do when they missed a class or when they miss an assignment, what do they do before, during, or after an experiment, or when you have class games or a quiz, etc. Also, make sure that your classroom is a safe place for everyone. Are there exposed wires or broken glass anywhere? Is there spilled liquid on the floor? If it is something you can address on your own right away, then make sure to do that. If not, turn in a report or job order ASAP. Make sure to model things so that they will know exactly how you want them to do things. If you want them to fall in line in a certain way, show it to them. You may have to repeat this several times 
times during the first few weeks until they get it. If you're teaching high school students, you might think, oh, this is too elementary. You know, modeling things so that the students know exactly what to do is needed. Even if they're high school students, they are still students. And, and one of the mistakes that teachers do is assuming that students know and that the students should know at a certain age. So let us not assume that. So it is better and it's safer that we model things to them, even if they are already high school students. What I did in my class as well was to include questions about routines, expectations, procedures, etc. in my bell work or quiz during the first few weeks. Just a question or two. For instance, when are assignments due? How much points do you lose for late assignments? And then ask them another one or two questions on another bell work or quiz. This way they are reminded and you will also have an opportunity to go over them quickly. The third trait of a teacher that will help with classroom management and consequently with student behavior is proactiveness. Anticipating possible issues or problems or source of confusion among students when they are going to do certain tasks or activity will help you plan for what to do and have on hand just in case. If you wait until something comes up before you do anything about them, this could lead to chaos, lots of complaining, and even accidents. You certainly do not want that to happen because you don't know if you have things or time or skills even that you need to solve the issue when they happen if you do not plan and prepare ahead. This is not necessarily just about materials to prepare. It also means that when you create worksheets or quiz or plan a game, make sure that you have clear instructions. Anticipate what could be the possible source of confusion when they do the activity. So make sure to have that in the instructions right away. Does your worksheet or test paper, if it is printed, have enough space for students to write their answers on? I had an essay test before and my teacher left a very small space for us to write our answers on and it just annoyed me. Just ruined my mindset that day. But being a Filipino student, I kept it to myself. But you don't expect American students to really do that. They will tell you that you did not provide enough space and you'll be hearing lots of complaining from them. So make sure to address this one. If it is a computer-based test, have you tried answering the test yourself to see if you put all the necessary information in the question or whether the answers are correct or not, you know? Things like this could cause chaos in class during a test or quiz or games if you did not test them or anticipate issues and resolve them right away. If not resolved, your test day or activity or game day will be full of complaining, eyes rolling, eyebrows raising, students will quarrel because your game rules are not clear so it's open for debate, etc. If you have observers that day, this would not be a good sight. Sometimes the reason why a class is chaotic is because the teacher did not plan ahead. The teacher did not give a clear and easy to follow instructions. The teacher failed to dry run the game or activity to see if it can be done within the period or if it's even doable in class. Fourth teacher trait is communication. It is important to communicate early, clearly, and simply whatever classroom rules and consequences procedures, routines, expectations to your students and their parents or guardians. For these things, it is a common practice in the U.S. to create a student contract where you will have information about the subject such as the course outline, grading system, and your rules and procedures. What rules do you have about turning in assignments? What will happen if students turn in late assignments or do not turn in an assignment at all? What is the rule about cell phone use? And things that are really important in class. Make sure to include the consequences there too. The students and parents or guardians will sign this and will return the signed part of the contract to you. Obviously, make sure that what you have in the contract is approved by the school or your coach. Your school should have a mechanics for this, so make sure you know that. At our school, they would ask to see the syllabus or contract before the start of the school year, and they would give us a go-ahead. So then I was sure that I did not put there anything that's contradicting school rules and regulations. Please know that there are some rules and procedures 
that are the same school-wide or department-wide etc so make sure to compare yours to these standards and then make some your own if they have questions about your rules then they can just simply ask you about it and explain it to them and they will see if it's okay or not in my case i did not have to explain any of my rules procedures etc all right teachers we're down to the fifth and last teacher trait on my list and it's efficiency one of the reasons why many students are not being on task or are not doing the task at hand or not turning in assignments is because they are not seeing real time how their laziness or lack of regard for your rules on turning in assignments are affecting their grades. They do not see the consequences of not participating right away till it is time for them to receive their report cards. Then when they finally see that they are failing, you will be bombarded with complaints and questions all trying to trick and intimidate you into changing their grades or extending the deadline or suddenly asking for extra credit work etc and if you allow them to do this during the first quarter expect that they will do the same exact thing during the second quarter the third quarter till the last quarter you will even start receiving emails from angry parents this is why I have to say it's one of the most stressful times in school hands down this is when you will experience students barging into your class while you are having a class just because they want to confront you about their grades. This is when students will be crowding around you wanting to see their grades so far, asking what they're missing, telling you they already turned them in even if they have not. This is where being efficient as a teacher comes in. Make sure to update the grade book and do not wait till the due date for the grades is near before you grade papers and update the grade book. If you do it like this, you will be surprised how bad each student is doing and and how many kids have not done any work but because you did the grade so close to the deadline you might not have enough time to do makeup works for students even if you give them makeup work days they will still think that it is your fault that they are failing because you did not inform them or tell them what they are missing although these things are something the students should know based on our experience that rarely happens if you call their parents or guardians about their kids not turning in work they will ask you why they are only finding about it now when it is just a few days till report cards are out so the teacher would end up giving in to the students because the teacher knows that it was her or his fault for not grading papers earlier all these stressful situations are definitely avoidable if the teacher is efficient in addition to having an established procedures rules and routines in class as i have described earlier you might say well i have so many things to do i do not have time to grade all of those papers and update the grade book i am also mentally exhausted and i am missing my family etc remember they do not see these things it doesn't matter to them all these kids care about is them not failing. Here are some suggestions to avoid having backlog when it comes to students' assignments and grades. Use technology. There are online tools where you can create assignments and these assignments will be graded automatically and right away. Of course, you have to set the correct answer so the system can do it. They have this in Canvas, Nearpod, Peer Deck, G Suites, Quizzes, Kahoot, Flipgrid, etc. Choose one based on the purpose of your activity and the standard you are trying to cover for that challenge. Chapter. I'm lucky that my school district has lots of these resources and Canvas is connected to the grading software we're using which is Skyward and so the scores are automatically syncing with that grading system. So I set my grades to update nightly so each day a student looks at it they know their grades real time. The parents can also access this but many would not look at it so what I do is to look at my grade book for now and then list down the students who are missing lots of assignments and then I would call home and tell their parents about it so no surprises if their kid is failing. Second way is to simplify your assignments. Do not do too much. Unless utterly necessary and required by your school or depending on the nature of your subject matter, avoid giving assignments that will require so much reading on your end and assignments that are complicated to grade. I know essays can be great ways in order to really gauge the student's understanding and they can actually go deeper but essays are really difficult to grade. So as a teacher, use the CRM as your guide. That's a curriculum guide, by the way, in order to know what kind of assessment tools 
or activities you can use and how often in order for you to really cover what's in the CRM. And then if your school is giving you that option to, you know, have that academic freedom to choose whatever assessment methods you want to use, then make sure to, to grab that freedom and use that in making your task easier. Again, as long as you reach the goal. Number three, identify which assignments you need to grade in detail and which ones you need to grade simply based on completion, such as if they turn it in, then they get 100%. If they don't, then they get zero. If they turn it in late, then they get a certain grade. Or you can just simplify it with all or nothing. If you are going to use this one, make sure that the score is not really high so that it's not too high stake. That's what I'm saying. For instance, you don't, you know, choose between zero and 100 points, right? So make sure that assignment is just like worth 10 or 15 points max. You can also do performance-based activities to assess students' understanding. For instance, you ask them to create videos, they can demonstrate, they can illustrate something. So as long as it's not involving paperwork and then you are still able to assess the students, then go for that. The aim is to avoid having too many paperwork because paper-based assignments they can easily get lost just by looking at it you are already stressed out make sure to consider this method as well this is probably the longest video that i have done so far it's because i really wanted to give you details on these things that helped me successfully complete my program of course there are other ways for sure but these were the ones that i tried myself you can try and tailor these according to your grade level and what kind of culture your school has and the kind of the standards that you are trying to meet. These are meant to be flexible. It's the principles behind the practices thus more or less universal. I taught high school students there for five years, so I know that this will work for high school students. So whatever principles you think might work for the lower grades, you can definitely try this out. Just like I said, focus on the principles and apply that to your class depending on what they need, depending on the culture of the school, etc. I know that there are so many things, insecurities, fear that go with being new in a school, wherever that school is. But please know that as long as your rules, procedures, these things that I have mentioned in this video today are not contradicting the school and the district's culture, rules, procedure, you should be fine. So be confident in enforcing them. Do not be afraid to call out a student who is misbehaving, who are not applying themselves. The school is expecting you to lead the class into learning. And as we all know, no amount of learning is ever going to take place in a class that's chaotic, where students can do whatever they want without any consequences. And finally, I want to say that building a good relationship with your students and their parents is one of the most important things that you can do in order to have this kind of classroom where everyone is safe, where learning is taking place from the beginning to the end. A classroom where whenever an admin pops in without any notice and observe your class, you can be confident that the students would know what to do. You don't have to be shouting in the front to ask them to sit down, to ask them to prepare their stuff to do things in orderly manner. Because if these things that we talked about here today were established, the students will know how to govern themselves, how to apply themselves. Of course, in order to build this kind of relationship with your students and their parents, you need to have time for it, right? So if you have not seen this video yet, I made this last week. I gave several tips here on how you can save time in doing schoolwork so that you will have enough time to get to know your students and their parents. Before I say bye, I have read somewhere and it says that the person is more important than the behavior that needs to be corrected. So make sure that even if you are applying these consequences, that despite being that teacher who they know will not tolerate their misbehavior, 
they should know that you love them that you are doing this because you care for them and that you want them to be successful so after applying the consequences make sure to talk to that student you can say hey i hope we're good make sure to email me if you need any help from me okay i hope you have a great day make sure to do that thank you for watching today's video and i will see you in my next one bye